All right, we're going to start and sing God of Wonders. house. Excited to be here tonight. Um, we are going to continue in our study of Romans. We're in Romans um, chapter 1 still. We just last week did the first verse of Romans 1 and we're going to be continuing that tonight. But um, let's open with a word of prayer. Um, Mike Blakemore, catching off the off guard here, will you open us in a word of prayer? Oh, Heavenly Father, we Thank you and praise you for this opportunity tonight to gather together to 
to your house and to hear your word preached. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we will be challenged as a result of hearing your word and that we would be better for it. And we just ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. There is a quote I found online from Timothy Keller, and he's a, a Christian writer, some of you know his works, and, um, but he was talking about Galatians 1, and um, even though he's talking about Galatians and we're in Romans, I want to read for you what he said, because I think it's fitting for what we have tonight. I said we found, I found this, actually Wendy found this, I'll give her credit where credit's due here. But he wrote, Christians, it says, who needs the gospel? Christians need the gospel. Our problem is, in the Christian life, our problem is, in the Christian life, come be, let me start over, I can read, I'm older, I gotta blow things up. <laughs> Who needs the good news? Christians need the gospel. Our problem in the Christian life comes because we often lose or forget the gospel. And we progress in our faith only as we grasp and apply the gospel in deeper ways. You know, when I first wrote this message, I was trying to put this message together, I was, it's really a focus on the gospel, because that's what you have in that first part of Romans. And I thought, man, Wednesday night, you know, it's most of the people there, are they're, they're long-standing Christians, they've been in the church a long time. But that quote from Teller is a great reminder that as Christians, we need the gospel. We need the good news as much as someone who's never heard that gospel. Um, so let's read, actually we're going to study 2 through 6 tonight, but since we just did the first verse, we're going to start, we're going to read all first six verses. It says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, guarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his namesake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Verse 2 talks about the, the gospel, the gospel that, that was promised, that was promised to us. And tonight, again, we're going to be looking at the, the reality of Jesus. And then we're going to talk about the second part, our response to that reality, our response to Jesus. So as we look at the reality of Jesus, in examining this reality, I want to ask you some questions tonight. Some questions about Jesus and, and see if you can say, yes, that is what I believe. First question, do you believe Jesus really lived in the flesh? Verse 3 is, is talking about his human nature and how he was a descendant of David. That means there was a man who lived in the flesh whose name was Jesus. That's where you have to start. That's the first question. Did he really live? All of us have to decide if, if there was really a historical character named Jesus who was born in Bethlehem, who grew up in Nazareth, had a ministry for three and a half years, and then was crucified. That's the first step. Did this man actually exist? Do you really think there really was this historical character? There's still some today who insist that Jesus was a myth. He never really existed. They believe he's like, Hercules or, or Jack and the Beanstalk. It's just some myth, some fairy tale. But when you start asking the question, was there really a Jesus? You have to say and look at, do we see writings or learning about him anywhere other than the Bible? Because for those people who claim that Jesus was a myth, and, then, and we ran into this overseas, and you would say, well, the Bible says they discount it because they said, well, we don't believe the Bible. So what about other writings? Do we have other proof of Jesus? There are a number of extra biblical references to Jesus. I'm going to share just a couple of with you tonight. Other writers who wrote about Jesus. In the year 90 AD, a Jewish historian named Josephus 
Um, he was not a Christian, but he wrote history. He wrote a lot about history. I want to read for you what he wrote. He wrote, now there was a man named Jesus, a wise man. If it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such truth that men received it with pleasure. He drew over to himself many Jews and many Gentiles. He was Christ. When Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, condemned him to the cross, those who loved him from the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them restored to life. For the divine prophets had foretold these and others wonderful things about him, and the tribe of Christians so named for him are not extinct to this day. This Jewish historian, who again wasn't a follower, wasn't a believer, believed and tells us about this man named Jesus. He verifies that he was crucified, and that his followers said that he had come back from the dead. If you study Greek literature, you come across the name Lucian of Samosota. He was a Greek writer, and, and he also did not like Christians. In fact, he was his writings, you'll find he's hostile to Christians quite often. But it's about 50 years after Josephus. And this is what he wrote in a letter. He said, the Christians, you know, worship a man to this day. The distinguished person who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. It was impressed upon these Christians by their original lawmaker that they are all brothers from the moment they are converted, and they deny the gods of Greece. They worship their crucified sage and live after his laws. These are just two writers, and, and there's others, outside of the Bible who said, yes, there was a man named Jesus. So that's where you start. That's the very beginning. Do you believe there was really a guy walking around that they called Jesus? Which leads us into the second question. Do you believe that Jesus really died on a cross? It's one thing to say he lived, but do you really think he died? History tells us even outside the Bible, this man, Jesus, was crucified. But the, that really isn't anything special because Men in the flesh were often crucified. Actually, the Romans crucified tens of thousands of common criminals. So the fact that, he, that he, he died on the cross doesn't make him different than a lot of other people of that day. Which kind of leads us into a third question. This, and this, is, this question is the one that separates those who follow Jesus from those who are not following him. Do you really believe Jesus came back from the grave. Was there a resurrection? Again, first you have to believe he died. There are some say, well, I don't believe the, the real resurrection because I, th I don't think he really died to start with. There are some people who claim that he was simply unconscious and, and then in the, in the coolness of the tomb, he was revived. There have been confused preachers who preached this and made this claim and that there was no bodily resurrection. It was just a spiritual resurrection in the mind and the hearts of the followers. And hear me tonight, to make this claim, you're taking away from Scripture and you're adding things that simply are not there. It's not a biblical view. The Bible clearly teaches that he was 100% dead and that he came back to life again. There used to be a magazine, I, I, it's probably still in print, I don't know, Christianity Today, I haven't seen a copy of it in, in, a, in many years, but it was, it was a popular magazine at one time, but they used to have a column in that called Dear Eutychus. It was the Christian version of a, of a Dear Abbey, and they would, they would answer questions that people supposedly wrote in. And um, one letter that, that someone wrote in at one time, they wrote, Dear Eutychus, our pastor said on Easter Sunday, that Jesus just swooned on the cross and that his disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? Signed, bewildered. I love this answer. Eutychus answers with, dear bewildered, dear bewildered. I suggest that you beat your pastor repeatedly with a cat of nine tails, nail him to a cross with large nails, hang him in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his heart, embalm him, and put him in an airless tomb for 36 hours. And see what happens. 
Yes, what you believe about the resurrection first begins by your belief that he really did die on that cross. And I'm not going to force you to believe, and God is not going to force you to believe. God gives you choice. He gives you free choice. God doesn't have some computer and he pushes a button and it forces each of us to, to go to our knees and, and just worship. No, he lets us have free choice. But yet, it is this resurrection, this resurrection of Jesus Christ that divides what people believe about Jesus because there are multitudes of people who admit that Jesus was a good man, that he was a good teacher, that he provided moral teaching. But when you say that he died, and then you say that he was resurrected, that makes a difference. All of a sudden, people aren't so willing often to agree with you. Verse 3 describes this earthly, human nature of Jesus. But verse 4 says, and, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed? Appointed. Some versions say declared. But both the words appointed and declared really don't give us as strong of an image as this text really should be. The original word in Greek it, it is a word from which we get our word horizon. But if you read it that way, through the spirit of holiness was horizoned, the Son of God in power. It doesn't really make sense, does it? One of the things I, I miss about living at the camp were the sunsets. Beautiful, beautiful sunsets, often reflecting off of the lake and and you can just see the horizon at such a distance out there. We have some great pictures of those sunsets. Have you ever been somewhere where you could see the horizon so well and the sunset was beautiful? I think of Florida, I think of beaches I've been to. Probably Hawaii had great sunsets. The line where the earth ends and the sky begins, or the sea ends and the, and the, and the, the sky begins, that what separates the water. The horizon, the horizon is a separation point. I read about when a pilot's learning to, to first fly. The first thing they're taught is visual flight rules, which means when you're out in the clear, you, you always look for the horizon to, to keep your relative balance. You, you try to keep your wings level to that horizon. And for pilots, when, they're, when they can't see the horizon, when it's dark, when there's clouds, when there's a storm. They have instruments that they use to help do this. Inside the cockpit is, a, is an, an instrument that's called an artificial horizon. It has a, a gyroscope that, that levels itself, always showing where the plane is in relation to the horizon. So when the Bible says Jesus was horizoned to be the Son of God by the resurrection, it's a separation point. It's a division point. It means it's the resurrection of Jesus that separates him from every other person who ever lived. There have been a lot of religious teachers, but, but Jesus Christ is the only man who ever died and came back from the dead and is alive forevermore. Some say, well, what about, what about all those near-death experiences? We have some in the Bible. The key word is near death. What about Lazarus? People say when he died in the tomb for four days. Four days he was dead. And Jesus raised him. He was raised from the dead. He came back to life. Well, here's the key. Anybody, anybody who has ever had a near-death experience or died, like in Lazarus' case, and were revived from the dead, they later died. Lazarus died again, but Jesus Christ is the only one who died and came back from the dead and kept on living and is alive today. That's the difference. That's the difference between being revived and being resurrected. Jesus Christ is horizon. He's that separation. He's set apart from everybody else in this resurrection. Mohammed can't claim it. Followers of Mohammed and Islam claim their leader was dead. They can't claim that he's alive forevermore. Buddhists can't claim it. 
There's people that follow Confucius. They can't claim it. Jesus is the only one that has claim to the resurrection. And when it comes to Jesus' resurrection, there's really only two positions. It's either fact or it's fiction. You either believe it really happened or you don't. Did it really happen or was it some fictional story? Let's imagine, if you would for a minute, that you owned a bookstore and everything in your bookstore had to be classification of either fiction or nonfiction. Where would you put the Bible? Would you put it in the nonfiction with, with, with historical truth? Or would you put it over here in the fiction where, where other fairy tales are, where myth, myth, mythology is? Or maybe you're a librarian, you have to classify all the books. Where do you classify the Bible? Where do you put it? Sounds like a simple question, but it's a fundamental decision everyone has to make. Did the resurrection of Jesus really happen? There are people who, who don't believe it happened, and they don't, simply don't believe it. I admire Thomas Jefferson. He had a great mind when it came to, to our government, our education, politics. He had some great ideas. But Thomas Jefferson was a deist. He was not a Christian. It means he believed in a deity, he believed in a power, but he did not believe that Jesus Christ was God. And Thomas Jefferson had an unusual practice. He, he liked reading the Bible, but when he read it, he would take a pen and he would mark out every section that, that dealt with the miraculous in the Bible. You can go to Monticello today and, and see the Bible that he used and, and where he marked out sections that he just didn't believe. Thomas Jefferson went through his Bible. He marked out all these, all the resurrection narratives in the four Gospels. If you go to his Bible, the Thomas Jefferson Bible, the Gospel story ends like this. It says, The disciples laid the body of Jesus in the tomb, rolled the stone over the opening, and they went away very sad. It's the end. That's the end of the story. Sad. It ends with a very sad note. The most important part of the good news is missing in Thomas Jefferson's Bible. For some people, that is the story of Jesus. They don't understand the rest of the story. They don't understand the good news. What sets Christians apart is that we believe that he, that he came back from the grave. So do you really believe that he came in the flesh as a man? Do you, do you really think he died on the cross? Do you, do you really really believe it? And do you really think that he came back from the dead? These questions and their answers lead us to our second part tonight. Our response. What should be our response to these questions, to Jesus? Because you can believe all these things and say affirmative to all these things in your head and also say, so what? You know, it's possible to believe and accept the historical events and yet never have a changed life. Most of you probably believe in 1969 that Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon and said, one small step for man, a giant leap for mankind. But there are some people who don't believe this. They think it was all done in a Hollywood studio. Actually, we have a family member um, or quite close to that. That when he was a kid, this was a huge event. That landing on the moon for him, and and it, he, he they, they studied about it. He saw the, the video of it and all that stuff, and and it's just a, it impacted his life greatly. And and I love. I believe. First of all, I will say I believe that we landed a man on the moon. But for years, I'll say, and when something comes up about space, I was like, yeah, you know, we didn't really leave a. They land the man. It was all done in Hollywood. And his lip will quiver. He'll get upset, and, and I love to pick at him with that. But it's in jest, not in, not in seriousness. You either believe or you don't believe it. You see, when you respond to Jesus, that's what exhibits a life change. There are different marks of a true believer. They include faith. They include total trust, not just mental agreement. Look at, look at our last two verses again. Through him, we receive grace and apostleship to call the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake 
And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. This is where Paul is, is talking about his response. Notice three words in these verses. He says, through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his namesake. And you are also among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. In those three words, obedience, faith, and belong, we see the way that we are to respond to Jesus. You may ask, well, wait a minute, doesn't, doesn't obedience come first? It is, it is obedience, but that obedience comes from faith. Notice there is faith before there is obedience. Faith is total trust, not just mental agreement. It's possible for a man or woman to believe Jesus lived in the flesh, that he died on the cross, that he came back from the grave, and still die and go to hell. It's not what you believe in your mind. It's what you accept in your heart. You can mentally agree with all those statements, but until it transforms your life and, and you internalize it, it means nothing. What is trust? Let me use this as an illustration. Some people don't like to fly. They, and maybe you're among that group. You know, the reason some people don't want to fly is they've not arrived at a point where they're willing to trust an airplane or, or trust a pilot or maybe trust the laws of, of aerodynamics. I don't fault people for that. There are just some people who have not chosen to put faith and, and trust in those things. The same thing is true when it comes to Jesus Christ. Think about faith in, in Jesus like flying an airplane. You can go out to the airport. You can watch planes take off and land all day long. You know what? You can say, I, I, I believe that airplanes can fly. You can go to the library and you know, the bookstores, you can get books on and study all about aerodynamics. You can read the history and learn about the Wright brothers and, and everything else. You can even talk to people and get testimonies, people who say, well, I've flown a lot in my life. You can believe in your head all those things, but you really, you really don't put your faith in that pilot, in that airplane, in the laws of aerodynamics, until you do what? Until you step foot on that plane, you squeeze in that little seat, you buckle the seatbelt, they shut the door, and they taxi out, and they go down that runway, and they take off. Every time you do that, every time, that's when you're putting your faith in the airplane, in the skill of the pilot, in the laws of aerodynamics. Not only do you believe in your head, you are entrusting your whole life to it. And the same is true about Jesus Christ. You can believe all those statements about Jesus in your head, but it's not until you entrust yourself to him that faith becomes real. Faith leads to something else. It says in verse 5, the obedience that comes from faith. That's the second response. You obey Jesus because you put your faith and your trust in him. Is there a song that you've heard so many times that it's stuck in your head, that comes back to your mind over and over again? There's a song that I've heard so often in churches, so many times, it's forever stuck in my head. And often it's a song that's sung so slow that it just kind of drags out. But the words, actually I'll start it, you guys help me finish, right? Just the beginning. Trust and obey. There was no other place. To be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. We know that song. We've heard that song over and over again. But that's it. Trust and obey. Notice it's not the opposite order. It doesn't say obey and then trust. It's trust and obey. 
for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Let me tell you something about obey. Faith that doesn't obey is faulty. Faith that does not obey is wrong. There's something wrong with it. It's faulty. And yet we have a dilemma in the, in the United States today. Statistics tell us that most Americans say they believe in God. And a majority of Americans claim to be Christians. The majority of Americans say they believe the Bible. Actually, the, the latest statistic I could find was 2019, but 65% of Americans in that, in that survey said that they were Christians. 65%. So what's the dilemma? What's the problem? The problem is that we don't have 65% of Americans that act like Christians. They're ignorant of this book. They don't know what it says. They're not obeying this book. What they're saying is, oh, I believe, I have faith. But the lifestyle doesn't match it. People can say all day long that they, they believe something, but unless they're willing to obey God, their faith is faulty. They'll say, well, well what are you talking about? I said I believe. They say, I, I, I said I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. Well, I don't think you have to go to church just to obey the book, though. The problem that is the book says to gather together with believers. They'll say things like, well, well, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ, but, but I don't know. You don't really have to love your neighbor. It's in the book. It's right here. You need to obey. They'll say things like, I, be I believe in Jesus. I believe in God, but I don't really need to be baptized. It's in the book. It's a testimony to hear to give. You see what I'm saying? You can, you can say what you believe all you want, but only that which you obey do you really believe. If you're not obeying it, you don't really believe it in your heart. Even Christians, we like to say, I believe in the Bible. I believe it cover to cover. All the way from the front to the back, from the beginning to the end. But the truth is, the reality is, the only part of the book that we believe are the parts that we obey. When we disobey the other parts, it makes all those other parts fluff. It makes them meaningless in our life. So we ask, is there obedience in your life? Do you have obedience? That's the question. Did you notice in verse 5, Paul says, it is obedience that comes from faith. Here's the third thing. It's a relationship. Now here's the sequence. There's faith, which produces obedience, which produces a relationship. Faith, obedience, Relationship. Look at verse 6 again. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. I like the phrase, belong to Jesus. Sometimes people say, well, I belong to New Beginnings Baptist Church. It's great when I hear that. But it's better to belong to Jesus. Belonging to a church won't get you into heaven, but belonging to Jesus will. What that means is you have to have a real relationship with Jesus. The most important question you'll, you'll ever answer is, do you know Jesus personally? Have you ever walked into a restaurant and you were going there to meet somebody and, and when you get there, there's a hostess and you look across the restaurant and you see the person you're gonna meet and you say, oh, I'm with them. I'm with them. You're saying, I, I know them. They know me. I belong with their group. It's okay for me to be with them. I belong with them. Maybe you're, you're 
in some social setting and, and you're talking with people and, and you see your wife across the, the room or, or your husband and you say, he or she, they're with me. You're saying they belong with me. You're describing a relationship. A relationship of marriage, a relationship of friendship. Some type of relationship is there. If you're a parent or a grandparent, don't you like talking about your kids or your grandkids? Why? Because there's a relationship. They belong to me. I've got a couple hundred pictures on my phone. I can show you my grandson. I'm excited because he belongs to me. There's a relationship. The question I have for each of us, when Jesus Christ is talking about you today, does he say to the Father, does he say to the angels, he or she, they belong to me. There's a relationship. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? It's amazing. If we look at our world today, there are some amazing things around us. Technology has advanced in the last 20 years in ways we never imagined. Computers are everywhere. Look at medicine, the advancements are incredible. I was, I was meeting with a guy yesterday, and he was talking about having open heart surgery, not the, the black, when they go in the little incision. This was the open heart surgery, and a few days later, he's back at work. About a year ago, a missionary friend of ours had a grandchild that was, her daughter was pregnant, and they found out while the baby, before he was born, had a heart condition. And again, I don't understand this whatsoever. Somehow they went in and they did surgery on that baby before it was born. She carried it full term and delivered a healthy baby with no problem. It's amazing. Technology and knowledge just keeps expanding. But church, morally, we're in trouble. Our morality is, is lagging behind all the other advances we have. You can turn on the news, you find shootings, abortions, sexual relations outside of marriage, or even common courtesy is disappearing. Why? Why is this taking place? Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Again, we're living in a world that is technologically expanding, but we're living in a world that still has people who have sinful hearts. And what they need, what everybody needs, is a new heart. A new heart that only comes by a relationship with Jesus Christ. I can ask you if you know Jesus, but a more important question is, does Jesus know you? Does he know you? The gospel, the gospel is the good news, but it's not the good news unless you know the bad news. Let me read to you what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. He said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and, and in your name drive out demons and in the name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Away from me, you evildoers. This is talking about religious people, folks. People who went to church. People who knew, knew the religious words. People he's talking about were, were involved in doing religious services. They, they did miracles. They performed prior prophecy. But somewhere, somewhere in the transaction, they never had that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They missed it. Let me compare this with, with another one of our forefathers, George Washington. Do you believe in George Washington? Sounds like a funny question. Do you believe the facts of his life and that he was the first president? That, that he was a revolutionary war general? Do you believe he had wooden teeth? 
Do you believe he crossed the Delaware River or the, the other things that are attributed to him that may or may not have been true? Do you think he cut down a cherry tree? You can believe or not believe all these things about him, but does anyone in this room, or if you're watching with us online, do any of you know George Washington personally? No, obviously not. George Washington is dead. But yet here, before us, we have Jesus of Nazareth. Do you believe he was, he was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, that he died on the cross, that he came back from the dead? And is there anybody in this room who really knows Jesus Christ personally? Yes, of course. You can't know George Washington, he's dead, but you can know Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is alive. You can think I'm crazy, you can think I'm weird, but regardless of all that, I know him. I know him intimately. I talk to him every day, many times through the day. I'm aware of his presence with me. Do you know him? Do you know Jesus Christ? You can believe the resurrection, but again, unless you know him, you've never experienced the resurrection in your life. I'm going to close with a story. There was an evangelist in the early 1900s named Vance Havner. He's from North Carolina, a country boy, and, and he traveled around the U.S. telling people, he was a great man of faith, and he loved telling people about Jesus. He told a story of a man who came home from work one day, and, and his wife is upset. She's visibly shaken. And the man says, honey, honey, what, what's wrong? What's the problem? Well, the strangest thing happened today. A man knocked on our door, and, and when I opened it, it was a stranger. And he asked me a question. He said, ma'am, do you know Jesus? She said, I was so shocked by his question. I, I didn't know what to say. I, couldn't, I didn't know how to answer. And eventually, I just, I just shut the door in his face. The husband begins to get a little upset himself, and he says, well, honey, why, why didn't you tell her? Why didn't you tell him that, that you are in the choir every Sunday, that you sing at church? Why didn't you tell him that, that you're president of the Ladies' Aid Society at our church? Why didn't you tell him that, that every Christmas you collect toys for the poor in the community? Why didn't you tell him any of those things? She said, because that's not what he asked. He asked, if I knew Jesus. Folks, the most important question you can ask, that you can answer, do you know Jesus personally? Join with me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth in your word, Lord. And we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to have a personal relationship with you, Lord to know you intimately. Lord, it's the greatest gift ever given. Help each of us to examine our lives and make sure we have that relationship with you, to build on that day by day. And help us to tell others, to ask that question. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And, and if someone says no or they're unsure, help point them to Scripture. Help point them to you, showing them the way, Lord. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.
Watching me.